Well, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to this Lunch Learn Link seminar sponsored by the Maryland Cigarette Restitution Fund and the Cindy Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center. We hold these uh, seminars a couple times a month, and if you're not on the email list uh, getting an actual notification of each meeting, uh, let me know. We can always add you to the list. And I welcome the online audience. So for those of you who are here or, and who know people who haven't seen, um, the, haven't attended today, uh, we are recording the lecture and it will be posted on the web so your colleagues uh, can tune in to it at, at a later date. Should be up in about a week or 10 days. So. Um, we welcome uh, all of those who are watching live online today. Um, that includes uh, members of the Howard University faculty, University of Maryland uh, faculty, and uh, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. So sp special welcome to all of you. Today we have um, Bernard Kwabi Adu uh, to talk with us about um, epigenetics disparities in the environment. And he uh, has a new book uh, published by Springer. So um, I'll be requesting it from our library so that you can read the electronic copy. Um, but also, um, uh, it's, um, it's a compilation of, um, of epigenetic information um, and has it, how it relates to disparities. So I'm looking forward to the talk today. Um, Bernard is an associate professor of biochemistry at Howard, uh, works with a number of uh, entities there, including the Howard University Cancer Center and the National Genomics uh, Laboratory. So uh, let's welcome Bernard. So thank you, Dr. Norma, for the invitation to come and talk about my book entitled Health Outcomes in a Foreign Land, A Role for Epigenomic and Environment Interaction. And I also want to thank the Environmental Health um, Agency for sponsoring this seminar. So the goal for writing this book is to uh, discuss the environmental components that are associated with health disparity and also to look at the biological determinant and how gene environment interaction can influence health disparity, and discuss the potential for multidisciplinary frontiers in addressing and reducing health disparities, and also the drive for personalized care. So health disparities are well documented in different parts of the world. Um, perhaps the earliest report of health disparity is by Ramazzini about 300 years ago, when he observed unusually high incidence of breast cancer in Italian Catholic nuns. Subsequent work carried out by a uh, British physician, Sir Pott, in 1775, reported high incidence of scrotal cancer in men who during their childhood were exposed to the irritating uh, suit from chimney sweep and cleaning chimneys. This was a practice done in Europe in Britain at the time. And a landmark uh, epidemiological report by Sir Edwin Chadwick, a British civil servant that was commissioned to look at the mortality rates between different social, um, different people belonging to different social classes, reported that professionals, the average life expectancy for professional individuals was about 35 years whereas the life expectancy for laborers and low uh, social class individuals was as low as 15 years, indicating that the difference in health disparity in Europe at the time was significantly associated with poverty, as well as other environmental uh, risk factors. So in European countries such as Britain, health disparity is based on the difference, differences in socioeconomic groups such that upper class educated and wealthy professionals are healthier compared to lower class, poor, uneducated, and the pop, uh, poor population. 
So in a predominantly heterogeneous population such as British uh, white, looking at health disparity from ethnic and racial groups such as the disparity in health as between British whites and black Jamaicans or Ghanaians have re received very little attention. However, across the Atlantic Ocean in the United States, health disparity is typically focused on looking at the incidence and mortality rates for diseases as it applies to different racial and ethnic groups. So there's been a lot of definitions of health disparity that has been put forth, and this has evolved over time from policymakers uh, and health professionals. But perhaps the um, best definition and the one that is commonly used and also the ones that really encapsulate the whole concept of health disparity was proposed by Margaret Whitehead as the difference in health outcomes that are, that are not only unnecessary or avoidable, but in addition are considered unfair and unjust. Okay. So the data from uh, Center for Disease Control on mortality rates for uh, US population indicates that the top leading cause of deaths for US, uh, the US population are, number one, heart disease, followed by cancer, chronic lower respiratory disease, unintentional injuries, uh, cardio, uh, cerebral, cerebral vascular diseases such as stroke, Alzheimer's, diabetes, pneumonia, kidney, and suicide. However, if you stratify disease mortality, disease incidence and mortality rate into different US racial and ethnic groups, African American are disproportionately affected by many of these diseases. Okay. There are a few diseases for which the uh, prevalence is lower in African Americans compared to uh, other ethnic and racial groups, such as COPD and also melanoma. All right. Otherwise, the overall, uh, in terms of health outcomes, the overall um, concept is that African Americans are disproportionately affected by disease and die from disease at a much higher rate compared to other ethnic and racial groups. Okay. So because of the high disease burden and mortality rates in the African American people, the life expectancy for the average African American in the US is much lower than other groups, especially uh, US Caucasians or white people. So in 1900, the average life expectancy was about 47 years old. Okay. And right nowadays, the average life expectancy has significantly increased to about 75 years old, 77 rather, excuse me. And this is attributed to improvement in environmental exposures, lifestyle factors, and also advances in, in the healthcare industry, such as immunization and so forth. However, the life expectancy for African American continues to lag. So even though the average life expectancy was 47 for whites, it was 30, 35 for uh, US blacks. And nowadays, the average life expectancy for black men is about 70, about 75 compared to 79 for um, white males. So this disparity has really persisted for several decades, if not centuries, and there are no signs of it narrowing. So what are some of the factors that are contributing to the disparity in health uh, and disease incidence and also mortality? So we typically um, consider poor health or higher risk of diseases as a result of aging, uh, gender, and also biological factors. But most uh, individuals also are, are knowledgeable of the fact that um, factors such as lifestyle exposures, tobacco smoke, excess alcohol binge, and sexual lifestyle can potentially affect or contribute to poor disease outcome. However, these factors are a small part of what is causing uh, health, poor health and also uh, health disparities. Nowadays, what we know is that health, poor health is a result of uh, a complex combination of so-called social determinants. In this uh, uh, occupation, education level, psychosocial factors, family factors, neighborhood, income, um, access to healthcare, and psychological factors. So these factors can independently or in combination with each other contribute to uh, health disparity and um, 
and the disease outcome that is commonly observed in different racial and ethnic groups. So for instance, when you look at the incidence of diet and cardiovascular diseases. So studies have actually looked at individual behavior regarding diet and diseases. So when it comes to diet, for instance, several factors come into play. Access to he healthy diet, convenience, and cost. So individuals who live in poor neighborhoods, such as minority of low, low socioeconomic status, will most likely purchase hamburger because these are easily accessible and these are convenient compared to fruits and vegetables and also these are more affordable. So the cost itself is also influenced by income and income obviously is a reflection of education. So there's a complex interaction of various factors that really affects the health of low socioeconomic status and the overriding theme is that of adverse health for minority uh, such as African American or Hispanics in the United States. Okay. So public health um, research studies looks at social economic status based on education, income, and occupation. Okay. And uh, the studies show that African Americans and other minorities have low rate of uh, bachelor degree attainment. Okay. So there's less than 21% of African American who attains bachelor degree compared to about 40% in whites, and Asians have the highest uh, percentage of bachelor degrees attainment. And this also reflects in the mean hourly income with minorities disproportionately having lower mean hourly income compared to uh, white and Asian population. And also African Americans are disproportionately represented in the labor force. Okay. So there's a strong relationship between health and education. Uh, health itself is a prerequisite for education such that children who have uh, attention deficiency or have hearing, hearing impair, impairment or who go to school on uh, empty stomach uh, struggle to attain the same educational level compared to other healthier children. Okay. And also knowledge about head, health are often taught in schools such that physical education itself combine information about the importance of physical activity and good health. So education is a major contributing factor for health. It is estimated that the average life expectancy for individuals with less than high school degree is about 96, excuse me, 69 years versus 84 years old for individuals who have graduate degree. So one mechanism by which we can intervene and uh, reduce health disparity is at the education level. So educational intervention can disrupt the cycle of poverty and adverse health as well as health disparities. So in addition to education, other social economic status such as income and employment, these are interrelated with one another but they all have unique roles in uh, addressing health disparity. So the U 2014 U.S. Consensus Bureau data on income and poverty shows that the mean household income for African Americans lag behind that of other groups. Okay. And also the poverty, percentage poverty threshold for African American and other minorities, such as American Indians, was significantly higher compared to whites and Asians. Okay. So some of the factors that can explain the lower mean household income in the African American population is mass incarceration, uh, residential segregation into poor neighborhood such that they don't have access to good jobs or transportation becomes an issue. Residential pollution and toxic condition can also affect their health such that they are not able to uh, consistently hold jobs. Okay. So there is also high risk of unemployment in minority populations, such as the African Americans, okay? And unemployment actually is very severe in this population because of low earning income and also the lack of family wealth, which is needed uh, to buffer against uh, periods of employment downturn. So these are some of the factors that are contributing to health disparity in the United States. So in addition to socioeconomic status, uh, it is estimated that 40% of behavioral factors contribute to premature death, okay? 30% uh, is the result of genetic uh, 
factors. 10% is the result of healthcare, access to healthcare, whereas 20% is the result of social and environmental factors, which I have alluded to earlier. So we all know that certain uh, behavior, such as um, consumption of uh, excess alcohol, tobacco smoke, and healthy dietary patterns, um, sedentary lifestyles are factors that consistently are related to poor health and also uh, these, uh, high incidence of disease. And these are factors that are very high in the African-American uh, uh, community. So in addition to low socioeconomic status, uh, living in uh, neighborhoods, poor neighborhoods, where there's high, heavy marketing of tobacco and alcohol, pretty much give a lot of access to uh, this uh, bad adverse uh, health exposures. So individuals living in this community are obviously exposed to alcohol and tobacco, um, um, alcohol and tobacco. In addition to uh, fast food such that most of the, their dietary pattern is that of poor diet and sedentary lifestyle. And also, again, I've, I've talked about health, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna talk about health literacy. So these are some of the factors that are uh, involved in these uh, behavioral determinants in African-American uh, communities, okay? So we know that uh, in, because behavior plays a very important role in health disparity, inter intervention at the individual behavior level can significantly uh, contribute to eliminating health disparity. Uh, the former Surgeon General uh, David Sasha indicated that 90% of the nat national health budget is targeted to treating disease and disease complications, whereas only 2 to 3% are targeted towards prevention. So perhaps if we can allocate some of this uh, national health budget towards preventative measures and also uh, behavioral interventions, this may be one way of uh, reducing health disparity. So health literacy also plays a very important role in health disparities. So health literacy is totally different from literacy, okay? It's defined as the ability or the capacity to obtain, process, understand basic health information and services to help make health uh, decisions, okay? So US has a very high adult population that have very low health literacy. So it, it is estimated that minorities, uh, particularly African-American, have about 21% adult African-American, 21% of adult uh, African-Americans are below basic health literacy. And this number is more like twofold higher in the Hispanic community. Now below health, basic health literacy is equivalent to a fifth grade uh, ability to read, and this is individuals with below basic health literacy find it difficult to understand uh, written medication information and so forth. Whereas about 20% have basic, which is equivalent to eighth grade uh, uh, reading level. So there's a high proportion of US adults who have basic or below uh, basic literary levels, and they have difficulty in interpreting healthcare information, okay? So adults with limited uh, literacy, health literacy also experience shame, uh, report poor health, um, have low self-esteem, and have limited ability to navigate uh, health care information. Okay. So individuals of low literacy also find it difficult to get flu shots, uh, undergo the recommended screening for various uh, cancer and have less knowledge about chronic diseases or how to even self-manage diseases such as diabetes. And they also have mistrust for the healthcare system, okay? So healthcare professionals must be aware of the low literacy, low health literacy in individuals, particularly for uh, minorities for whom English is not their first language. And to be able to design culturally competent health information, there's a huge price tag to uh, poor or low health literacy. It cost the nation about 238 million as a result of adverse health due to low health literacy. This is reflected in the increased uh, emergency room visitation, acute uh, care, adult care services, uh, frequent visitation to hospital, and perhaps an even longer stay in hospitals. So again, intervention at the literacy, health literacy level is one way of bridging health disparities. 
Okay. So another important uh, determinant of uh, health disparity is psychological factors. So psychological studies look at individuals' behavior, lifestyle choices, and well-being. Okay. So individuals of high socioeconomic status uh, typically will uh, report good health. They live longer, whereas individuals of low socioeconomic status who report poor health are often depressed because they live in environments where there's a lot of environmental uh, stresses, uh, social inequities, and also poor social network, as well as discriminatory factors. Okay. So environmental stresses uh, and moods alter individual physiological processes. <clears throat> So environmental stresses are typically uh, translated into the uh, central nervous system in the region of the so-called hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. And this leads to a cascade activation of hormones leading to secretion of cortisol, which in turn controls the uh, uh, synthesis of adrenaline and no adrenaline, which is the uh, fight and fright hormones. Okay, So small levels of uh, Cortisol release is important during periods of acute stress is help us to deal with the situation. But individuals living in uh, socioeconomic poor areas are constantly barrage of environmental stresses and the chronic release of cortisol is significantly associated with condition, conditions such as metabolic syndrome, which underlines a lot of chronic diseases including cardiovascular disease, diabetes and even cancer. So psychosocial stresses, if not ameliorated, um, is a very important uh, risk factor for health disparity. Okay. So uh, I hope that the few uh, slides that I've shown is really convinced you that there's a strong uh, socioeconomic and environmental uh, risk factor that is contributing to health disparity. But these environmental factors do not explain all the um, dis health disparity that is reported. So genetics play a very important role. Evidence from um, uh, human genetic studies have shown that, um, and also from fossil remains that resemblance uh, modern human, shows uh, support the existence of life in Africa for about 200,000 years, okay? Now the African continent has a wide diversity of uh, geographical and environmental uh, factors. So there are uh, tropical rainforests, savanna, uh, mountainous region, coastal plains, okay? And also one of the most formidable diseases on the African continent is malaria. And a lot of diseases have evolved, in, evolved including sickle cell, uh, as a selective against selection against malaria. In addition to that, there's a lot of genetic variants that have evolved, evolved in resistance to malaria, including the Duffy gene, host of HLA variations, and APOE genes. Okay. So Africans living on the African continent have evolved all the selection against their formidable opponent, which is malaria. Okay. Now the African Americans living in US have been in this country for over 400 years. Okay and have adapted to the environment. Now, what we are beginning to see through genome-wide association studies is that uh, migration from Africa to the United States and other uh, Western countries, over a period of time, we lose the, uh, some of this natural selected variant to resistance to infectious diseases on the African continent and are becoming associated with a host of non-communicable diseases such as cardiovascular disease, cancer, obesity, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and HIV and kidney diseases also. Okay. So uh, the completion of the human genome sequence has really revolutionized our understanding of the role of genetic variations in human populations. So we all know that now we share 99.5% in sequence uh, similarities between different populations belonging to different racial and ethnic groups. And there are only 0.5% variation in the sequence, which encodes for differences in skin pigmentation, hair color, eye pigmentation, and so forth. And the 0.5 percentage also var genetic variants encode for uh, resistance and susceptibility to different diseases, and also how we metabolize drugs and uh, other um, metabolized drugs and so forth, okay? 
But um, racial segregation has consequences on health and health disparities. And I'll briefly mention five areas where racial discrimination can really uh, uh, cause havoc on, on, on minority health, such as barriers to economic and social opportunities, uh, racial segregation into poor neighborhoods. Okay, again, there's a lot of environmental stresses in poor neighborhoods. Adverse psychological effects, mental, physical, and verbal abuse. Uh, these have effects on our health. And targeting uh, of the tobacco and alcohol industry. So we know that we've made some good progress in that area, but minority and poor neighborhoods are still being targeted by the tobacco and alcohol industry. And also lack of access or adequate medical care. Okay. So, but we still use race, uh, and in fact, med our medical records, we, you have to identify yourself by race uh, or the ethnic group that you belong to. But also we run in the risk of assuming that poor health has genetic and biologic basis. This may be for some diseases, but overall, most of the poor health that is reported in minority population has a very strong social and environmental as well as political factors. So the uh, recent increased risk of obesity in recent African, West African migrants to Europe and also the United States has no uh, biological basis. Similarly, alcoholism in red Indians, American Indians who live on reservation does not have a uh, genetic um, basis to it. However, there's a strong social, environmental, and political factors that may perhaps be driving some of this um, adverse health. So perhaps a better use of race as a surrogate marker is in identifying disease prevalence in individuals or at risk population, and especially in the area of pharm pharm pharmacogenetics, okay? So we, we realize that there's a lot of genetic variants, especially genes that play a role in drug metabolism. Uh, for example, the uh, cytochrome P450 class of enzymes, okay? So in this era of opioid epidemics, this is an area that we need to focus our research attention on, the area of microgenomics, to, in order to give individuals the optimum uh, drug dosage, not suboptimal or overdose that are associated with uh, um, addiction and so forth. But I think a better categorization is perhaps a population based on shared genetic or adaptive traits, okay, to ensure that individuals with high risk genetic profile, not based on race, because when you uh, reduce sickle cell disease to black disease, you marginalize individuals from uh, uh, Middle East or some parts of Asia who also suffers from sickle cell disease, okay? So it's important that we categorize individuals based on some sort of genetic profile and adaptive traits so that they can all take full advantage of certain preventative measures that are out there. Okay, so again, genetic variations in different population is um, beginning to help us understand how uh, information in the DNA sequence is being uh, executed at the cellular level in terms of differences in gene expression. But genetic variation does not necessarily explain all the phenotypic differences, uh, especially in the area of disease that is uh, seen in individuals, okay? So epigenetic mechanisms also play a very, very important role uh, in regulating how genetic information is expressed across development, tissue, environment, and disease state. So for instance, epigenetic mechanisms play a very, very important role during development. One in uh, establishing uh, cell and tissue type diversity and also in maintaining an heritable cell and tissue, tissue type identity. Okay. So three of the main epigenetic processes in human beings are DNA methylation, histone modification, and microRNA. Okay. So I'm gonna present a few slides looking at the role of epigenetic changes and health disparity. So Jean-Pierre Issa proposed uh, a few years ago that we all begin life with some sort of uniform epigenetic patterns. But as we age, get exposed to various environmental factors such as diet, um, alcohol, uh, tobacco smoke, and so forth, some of the cells begin to acquire epi epigenetic changes which leads to fields of patches of faulty gene expression. But over an extended period of time, these uh, abnormalities can lead to diseases such as cancer, okay? We have shown that DNA methylation 
increases as a function of age, okay, at least for individuals uh, with in prostate tissues, excuse me, okay. So other studies have shown that genome-wide gene, genome methylation differences in cord blood that are obtained from a newborn African-American compared to European-American babies, okay, suggesting that there may be differences in the environmental, uh, in utero environmental exposures between these two groups, and also maybe genetic differences in the uh, epigenetic machinery, okay, could attribute to the differences in the methylation pattern. Studies by Fraga reported that monozygotic twins have virtually indistinguishable epigenetic pattern during early life, but as in adults have these dramatically differences in epigenetic patterns. Now, because monozygotic twins share the same genotype, this difference in the epigenetic pattern is not due to biological factors, but it's actually due to environmental exposures, okay? Other studies have reported that differences in age-related global methylation in individuals, centenarians versus people who do not live long. Um, again, suggesting that there's a strong environmental component to differences in the epigenetic pattern. So perhaps epigenetic uh, base could be used, could be a useful marker for predicting uh, health and, and health outcomes. Okay. So uh, my lab has been very interested in looking at the role of epigenetic changes, specifically DNA methylation changes in health disparity. And we have reported uh, several uh, work looking at gene-specific loci, particularly for genes that play a role in as uh, tumor regulatory factors, okay? And comparing the epigenetic pattern in normal cancer from both African-American and Caucasians. And we have reported significant differences in the epigenetic patterns, okay, at the uh, gene-specific loci. We also see differences at the gen genome-wide level between uh, African Americans and their Caucasian counterpart. So other people have also reported differences in the methylation level, looking at promoter regions, not promoter regions, and intergenic regions. So methylation clearly is contributing to health disparity, okay? So in addition to uh, differences in DNA methylation, there are groups who have actually reported epigenetic uh, microRNA changes to be, uh, to be associated with prostate cancer disparity. So Sylvastana's work found that there's significantly lower expression level of microRNA 99B compared to Caucasian prostate cancer, okay? Now microRNA 99B targets the mTOR pathway to suggest that um, epigenetic is controlling uh, the expression of signals in this pathway, and this may potentially contribute to the disease, uh, prostate cancer disease milieu in the different uh, population that they studies. So other groups have reported that genes that play a role in histone uh, modification, particularly MTA1, there's also differences in the um, expression level in this gene in different racial and ethnic groups, and this potentially is associated with uh, disease progression. So there's accumulating uh, data from uh, life course exposures and health disparity to indicate that fetal origins of adult disease, okay? So what the growing fetus get exposed to in the in utero environment does not only have effect on the infant life, but can affect the infant, teenage, and even into adulthood, okay? So, um, David Barker is reported to be the first person who uh, proposed the fetal origin of adult diseases by noting that cardiovascular diseases were prominent in individuals who uh, were small for gestation age when they were babies. And since then, there's been a lot of other reports that have associated uh, small gestation age with diseases, including type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and renal, fa renal fa failure, okay? Some of the popular data came from the Dutch famine. Uh, it's reported that towards the second half of the Second World War, uh, there was a food shortage in, in Holland, and pregnant women at the time were subjected to food rationing which is uh, no malnutrition and so forth. So individuals that were born to pregnant women at the time, in their adulthood significantly were at risk of various diseases such as cardiovascular disease, renal failure, and so forth. So what we get exposed to in the in utero conditions play a very, very important role 
in the overall outcome of an individual. And some, in some instances, this may have transgenerational exposure. So Hopkins, a renowned prostate cancer researcher, Dr. Donald Coffey, proposed that estrogen could be at the root cause of prostate cancer, noting that prostate cancer incidence was uh, higher in, uh, environmental, in environments where breast cancer incidence is also high. And there's been a lot of studies in animals where exposure to bisphenol A or estradiol significantly increase uh, prostate cancer, okay? So exposure to hormonal levels, uh, uh, for instance, uh, pregnant women circulating levels of, different circulating levels of estrogen or testosterone in pregnant women may be underlying the differences that we see in prostate cancer disparity. So other life factors such as tobacco smoke and alcohol clearly influence uh, the health of the growing fetus and also infants. And pollution, environmental pollution, such as exposure to carbon monoxide and so forth, uh, can disrupt endocrine signaling. So what we get exposed to in the interine uh, environment significantly affects uh, the health of the growing fetus. And again, the epigenome programming uh, of developing fetus is very, very important and very sensitive to maternal nutrition, hormones, stress, and so forth. Um, so if we are really serious about intervening and bridging health disparity, perhaps intervening at the in utero condition level uh, may be a key. And I'll talk a little bit about this later on. So I have a few slides to describe uh, gene environment interaction and how it contributes to uh, specific diseases, such as uh, hypertension, okay? So hypertension has uh, uh, strong comorbid conditions, including obesity, kidney disease, premature birth, and so forth. So in addition to diet that is uh, high in sodium, environmental stresses, and also genetic variants uh, in the so-called renin angiotensin, angiotensin pathway significantly contributes to hypertension uh, risk and the disease disparity. Okay, so similarly for cardiovascular disease, again, there's a very strong uh, early life exposure, such as the intrauterine environmental conditions, okay. And there are also comorbid conditions, such as diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and so forth. And these comorb comorbidity conditions are predominant in minority populations, such as African American. And also, GWAS studies have uh, identified various allelic variants, again, in the renin angiotensin pathway, uh, and genes that play a role in the immunity and inflam inflammatory pathway to contribute to cardiovascular disease. Um, disparity. And there are also reports of epigenetic changes such as histone acetylation and demethylation patterns that are associated with actually the development of the chambers of the heart. Okay. So there's a, an interplay of uh, environmental genetic as well as epigenetic changes that is giving rise to differences in cardiovascular disease risk. Okay. So similarly, when we look at gene environment interaction with diabetes, um, again, there's a lot of comorbid conditions. Uh, one of the big risk factors is obesity, uh, sedentary lifestyle, poor diet, and again, fetal origins. Uh, but through the Howard Hopkins uh, uh, research work, uh, one of the projects was the ADAM project. They had identified a lot of genetic variants in African-American uh, populations that may be associated with uh, increased risk with uh, diabetes okay, in this disparity, uh, in this population, excuse me. And also there's epigenetic changes such as the insulin growth factor, uh, DNA methylation changes in insulin growth factor, methylation of the uh, fat mass and obesity associated protein can influence expression and lead, contribute to uh, differential susceptibility to diabetes, okay? So similarly, we see uh, gene environmental interaction playing a role in kidney, kidney disease disparity, okay? So some of the comorbidity conditions are obesity, uh, uh, diabetes, high cholesterol, smoking, chronic inflammation, 
and also fetal origins to the disease. And uh, some of these comorbid conditions are, again, predominant in minority populations, such as African-American and also in the Hispanic community. But again, there are genetic variants that have been reported to be associated with differential um, risk to kidney disease in different racial and ethnic groups, including the Apoli-1 gene and myosin heavy chain. Okay? And epigenetic also come into play. Studies have shown that chromatin remodeling and aberrant histone modification in key pro-inflammatory kinase, uh, cytokines and aberrant methylation interferon gamma uh, contribute to increased risk in uh, kidney disease and also the disease disparity. So we all know that uh, cancer is actually a multifactorial disease. Uh, some of the environmental risk factors are race, age, uh, smoking, sedentary, diet, um, screening, and so forth. Okay. And the Howard Hopkins partnership has also been instrumental in identifying genetic variants that could contribute to prostate cancer disparity in African American and other racial groups. Okay. So we have reported a significant genetic variant in the androgen receptor gene CYP3A4 temperous egg fusion shows differential uh, fusion gene in different uh, ethnic groups. Perhaps the most significant finding is genetic variants on chromosome 8Q24 that are significantly associated with uh, prostate cancer risk in African-American population. In terms of breast cancer disparity, there are subtypes of breast cancer, and African-American have the most aggressive form of breast cancer as a result of having the triple negative, which is uh, estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2 negative. Okay. So colorectal cancer has a strong genetic uh, predisposition or familial disposition contribution. And genetic variants in the vitamin D receptor also contributes to uh, differential risk in colorectal cancer. Okay. So perhaps when you look at the role of epigenetic changes in, cancer, uh, in diseases, cancer has received the most attention. Through the Howard Hopkins partnership, we have identified aberrant expression of a lot of genes that shows differential uh, methylation in prostate cancer in African Americans compared to Caucasians, including GST, pyretinoic acid receptor gene, temperance egg, and so forth. And similar reports from our group and also others have shown aberrant methylation in HIN1 gene, cadherin 13, and um, SFRP1. Also, colorectal cancer has a very strong hypo and hypermethylation component to it. Um, and actually, in, in cancer, epigenetic changes are, appears to occur very, very early in the disease pathway and perhaps more common and more consistent than other epigen uh, genetic alterations. So maybe epigenetic, uh, uh, we should focus on looking at uh, intervention at the epigenetic level okay, for cancers, particularly prostate cancer. So in addition, addition to aberrant uh, epigenetic alterations, epigenetic um, uh, microRNA such as uh, MER182 that targets Fox transcription factors have been reported to be differentially expressed in different uh, groups. Right. Okay. So right now, uh, the racial and ethnic distribution of U.S. population is about 66%. Uh, white or Caucasians, 13% uh, uh, blacks, 15% Latino, uh, small proportion for Asians uh, in the US. But it's projected that in the year 2050, um, there will be less than, the US population will consist of less than 50% uh, Caucasians or white, okay? So there will be minority majority population, okay, in the US by the year 2050. Now, I've explained that uh, a lot of the diseases uh, are disproportionately affecting minority. So it's important that we address some of this health disparity. Okay? Otherwise, in year, by year 2050, we're going to have a huge burden on the healthcare uh, because of the changes in the demographics in the US population. So I'm going to um, look at uh, translating uh, health disparity, okay? So we all know that health uh, expectancy, life expectancy has improved. We are living much lo longer. Infant mortality is on the decline. 
but the disparity still persists. In 2009, the average life expectancy for African American men was 71 years, and for Caucasian is 76 years old. And this disparity stubbornly persists. Okay? So uh, in 1985, there was a landmark report issued by the Health and Human Services Department, popularly known as the Heckless Report. So this report, for the first time, consolidated um, uh, factors and recommendation based on the minority health, which was due uh, based on tax force that was set to find out what is driving um, health disparity in the minority population. So the recommendations from uh, the task force that were set up to investigate minority health was that we need more awareness, education, research, uh, improved healthcare delivery, and so forth. But what they found out was that the, uh, the factors that are driving health disparity is very complex and defies uh, simplistic um, explanation. As a result, uh, the Health and Human Service de uh, Department began to have different um, healthcare priorities, and this evolved into the so-called healthy people. So healthy people is a, a, ten, is a set of 10-year national health objectives, which started in um, 1990. So every 10 years, they set certain objectives, and at the end of the 10-year period, assess whether they've been able to accomplish that. So we have healthy people, 1990, 2000, 2010, and now healthy people 2020 is upon us, okay? So how far has healthy people come? Um, there's been progress in life expectancy. Okay? We are again living much longer because of improvement in sanitation, improvement in um, the healthcare industry, okay? And um, children are living much young, uh, longer. Uh, improvement in neonatal and postnatal um, life through immunization, and also success in treatment of HIV AIDS, and also uh, success in the area of tobacco smoke cessation. And some sector of the US population are adhering to healthy lifestyle, which is leading to cancer prevention. But there are huge challenges. Obesity, there's no decline in obesity. In fact, obesity is going in the opposite direction. And the disparity is also on rise as a result of differences in socioeconomic status, education, racial discrimination, okay? And also, I mentioned that there are success in tobacco smoke cessation, but this is not reflected in all communities. So especially in low uh, SES or uh, poor neighborhoods, the tobacco industry is still targeting minority, okay? Again, um, even though we all know about the importance of exercise um, and healthy living, certain neighborhoods do not have access to fresh fruits and vegetables, okay? Or safe environmental conditions to be able to do the recommended uh, exercise. So this is some of the things that are underlying the disparity that is ongoing, okay? So um, I mentioned that um, in neutral condition, there's life course, impo expo life course um, importance to health, okay? So adverse childhood health and prenatal exposures play, play a very, very important role. So this is an area that we need to intervene. In the US, African Americans have high incidence of neonatal mort mortality and also postnatal mortality, okay? So this is one area of importance intervention. Uh, life course theory proposed by Cheng and Solomon indicated that we need improved access to prenatal care from conception throughout uh, the pregnant pregnancy period, okay? So this in requires involvement of obstetrician, gynecology, pediatrician, internal uh, medicine, physicians, who collaborate together to provide a pregnant woman the, import the necessary uh, information for preconception health, and also provide young parents with information that is needed to prevent uh, obesity. <clears throat> so again, I mentioned that behavior plays a very, very important role in health disparity. After all, 40% of behavior contributes to uh, premature death. So this is an area that uh, we can intervene. 
And nowadays there is this community-based participatory research. These are outreach workers and peer educators who collaborate and work with medical researchers to provide efficacious non-pharmacological lifestyle and behavioral interventions. One su such success report is the so-called DASH diet that has been shown to significantly improve our hypertension outcome. And also cancer prevention is one area where we've made some huge uh, progress. Okay. So again, we need uh, to continue uh, to um, advocate for uh, counter advertisement to the tobacco industry, provide low cost uh, tobacco smoke cessation mechanism if we are to uh, reduce the burden of tobacco um, addictions among the low socioeconomic and minority individuals. And also we need to target the reduction of blood pressure and stress level. Improve health literacy. Again, over 20 or over 30 percent of U.S. adults are considered uh, poor health, considered to have poor health literacy. So we need educators, community workers to design educational programs that fit uh, community setting. And we continue. To, we need education and advocacy awareness in the area of cancer screening, uh, increased recreational facilities in low socioeconomic uh, communities. Okay, so I'll skip the slide. Um, so again, translational uh, health disparity. I think this is a very exciting era in precision medicine. Again, uh, technological advances in the human genome research has revolutionized healthcare delivery. Uh, so now we can identify candidate genes based on the GWAS studies, uh, identify genetic variants that are associated with disease susceptibility, uh, resistance, and differential clinical outcomes. Okay. Now we are using the electronic health uh, records, excuse me, electronic health records um, based on individual genomic information, social demographic, and environmental information, as well as family history of disease. Uh, in order to drive disease treatment, okay? So the so-called precision medicine um, looks at uh, transcription, proteomic, metabolomic, or the omic data, plus uh, the electronic health records for target physiological and pharmacological responses to specific uh, therapeutic treatments. And this is really helping in the addressing uh, access to healthcare and, and health disparities. Okay, so I hope that I have presented some factors to help us all appreciate that we do face a mammoth challenge uh, of health disparity. There are no single fact, there's no single or individual factors that can explain all the incidence and mortality rates that are associated with disparity. So intervention to reduce disparities in U.S. must take concerted effort at the individual level, especially in the area of behavior, at the family, community, local government, uh, local and state level, as well as government policies in order to uh, reduce health disparity in the US. And I will stop here and thank you for your audience. Thank you, Bernard. We have some time for questions from the audience. Uh, yeah, the, you've covered a lot of ground here. Um, I just had a, a question about early on in your talk, you had a, a pie chart, which was, uh, I think it was health disparities and what was the cause, and majority was lifestyle and, and behavioral factors. And then there was a very large chunk, genetics, that I think was 30%, um, which seemed a little high to me, I don't know, I come from the cancer world and we usually think the pure genetics is 10, 15, maybe 20 percent. Um, I was wondering if, if you were, if there were spe other specific diseases you were including there that would drive, that were much more uh, heavily influenced by genetics or whether you were including gene environment in that genetics part of the pie. Just, uh, just curious. Right. I didn't see a reference on this. So I didn't know where the yeah, was coming I from. Yeah, unfortunately, I forgot to include the reference on that. And I, I think you make a very important uh, point. So when we look at familiar predisposition to diseases such as cancer, it's less than 10%. 
Okay, so this 30% you write is quite, is, is quite high, and I need to go back and uh, tease out how they came up with that number. But um, so I think there may be gene environment interaction in, in that, because it's very difficult to tease out the genetic environment interaction. After all, we know that uh, genetic variant that is driving uh, genetic variants in various metabolic pathways is driving some of the biology, and it's very difficult to really tease that out uh, from the environment uh, factors. So uh, yeah, you, you're right. It could be a reflection of gene-environment interaction. <clears throat> so Bernard, I was curious about the map that you showed, you know, with Africans coming to the US mm -hmm. and now um, being a genetic mixture of individuals in this country. Um, are there specific um, diseases and, and gene and environment uh, issues that you could highlight from what we know about Africans and then African Americans? Mm -hmm. um, so again, on the African continent, uh, our main, uh, the diseases on the African continent are mostly infectious disease. So for instance, when you look at cancer risk on the African continent, uh, the top leading cancer risks are liver cancer, stomach cancer, and cervical cancer among women. And all these diseases have a very strong infectious uh, component. Okay. Uh, so the other thing is, uh, I think when you look at in life expectancy for Africans on the African continent, it's much lower than uh, African Americans in the US. And a lot of the diseases have age association to it. So perhaps, individuals in the African continent don't live long enough to begin to manifest some of these non-communicable diseases. On the other hand, in the US, and again, um, most of the diseases that disproportionately affect African Americans are this non-communicable cardiovascular cancer and so forth. But the African American uh, population are, again, as you mentioned, mixed ancestry. So they have, on the average, about 20% Caucasian ancestry and about 80%. So in terms of the genetics, it's a little bit different to that of uh, individuals from the African continent. Yeah. But the data that is coming out through GWAS is that some of these uh, genetic variants that gives uh, advantage to individuals on the African continent are now being associated with non-communicable diseases in the US uh, and other Western world. <clears throat> Hi. Um, Hi. You had shown a uh, breakdown of the um, methylation differences between African Americans and European Americans, um, but have also spoken uh, a lot about the social determinants of health. Um, you'd also mentioned that in Europe, with a more heterogeneous um, uh, differences in socioeconomic status, um, that that's, their f that's where most of their research is focused on. I was wondering if you had looked at any methylation dif differences or epigenetic differences, um, not necessarily within uh, the different racial communities, but within, um, and had seen any differences in um, different socioeconomic groups of of the types of things you've been so, seeing? So yeah, that's a very good uh, question, and I have not. So even when we look at the methylation pattern, and uh, we can quantify methylation level in individuals. So the data that I showed, um, when you look at the methylation in individuals within, let's say, the Caucasian population, you see differences. And again, this could reflect um, differences in dietary pattern. After all, one of the main substrate for methylation is uh, uh, methionine. Um, and also maybe the um, genetic variants in the DNA methyltransferases genes, okay? So we need a large cohort of people to really begin to do some of the studies that you are proposing. But yes, I think it's worth doing, and I think we can see some differences which we can correlate with socioeconomic status and so forth. Okay. So, um, 
Bernard, thank you so much for coming today. I'll say to the audience, if you have additional questions, Bernard will be here for a couple of minutes. Uh, I invite you all to have pizza in the gallery. Uh, to do that, you get a uh, ticket from Nicole over there on your, on your way out. But thanks for coming today, and thanks again to Bernard Kwabi Adu. Thank you very much for inviting me.